Hi, it's great to be with you. You're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. My name's Simon Smart. And I'm Natasha Moore. And before we start today, just a a quick warning. Uh, The topic that we'll be dealing with today is not appropriate for small children. So if you have small children with you, uh, it'd be better probably if you were to turn off and come back to this later. Well, it's a public health crisis that's been building for some time, but one that people rarely want to talk about, and that is the problem of kids being exposed to pornography at earlier and earlier ages and in unprecedented numbers. I've had children ask me about sex webcam sites. I've had children ask me about bestiality websites. Um, Quite confidently, I'm from the age of 11. That was Susan McLean, an internet safety expert and director of Cyber Safety Solutions. Last year, she ran more than 470 presentations for teachers and parents on how to keep their students and children safe online. For many children that see porn, it will not be a problem. They will see it, they'll move on, not a problem in the world. But for some children, they will see it, they will see stuff that's not linked to their age or stage. They won't have an understanding of what it is or the reality of it. They're seeing rape and torture, which of course is inappropriate for anyone to be viewing. And it gives them a skewed view of normality. So if they routinely see it and they believe this is how the world works, they will then act that out in their, uh, their private and personal lives. Research has shown that more than 90% of boys under the age of 16 and around 60% of girls have visited a porn site online. And this is having a huge impact on the way that children and young people think about their sexuality, about relationships and about the opposite sex. The availability of online porn has been called one of the biggest unconscious social experiments ever conducted. I'm only 19, but I can already see a difference in 15-year-olds and 16-year-olds and how pornography is definitely increasing and it's changing the way that people value each other in society. And I can't say that I've found a single young person who it hasn't affected in some way. One of Australia's leading experts in this area, how porn harms our kids, is Liz Walker. Liz says she's an ex-porn addict herself and the founder of Youth Wellbeing Project. Great to have you in, Liz. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Now, this, this is a very much a, a personal story for you. You say you were six years old when you first saw porn. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I was on a school bus and uh, a girl a couple of years older than me hopped on next to me and said, hey, can I show you something? And I'm um, like, sure. And she's like, this was underneath my brother's bed. And, and what she showed me, I certainly wasn't ready for. It was page after page after page of graphic images. It wasn't a Playboy or a, anything else. It was, it was a hardcore graphic magazine with film strips and lots of images, one after the other. So as you looked at the pages, it was like it was playing out in a movie. And, and it was really shocking to me. I felt sick and disgusted. Um, but also at the same time, I, I felt those feelings of arousal at the age of six. So it awakened my sexuality in a way that I certainly was not expecting or ready for. No, and you say that this had a really quite a profound impact on you as you were growing. Um, this wasn't something that I felt I could talk about with anybody, and, and that was quite problematic. I, I internalised those messages, kept them quite secret, hidden. I felt um, ashamed and guilty, but at the same time, curious and wanting more. So, um, you know, there were several things that I started to act out with other children, but it wasn't long before I found another stash of of magazines and and continued to feed that uh, interest in a way that certainly impacted on the way I thought about myself and the way I thought about sexuality and, and, and the others around me. As you got into adolescence, presumably this became more intense. Oh, definitely. And uh, relationship after relationship, I was very much mimicking uh, what I had seen and continued to feed into. So what have some of the long-term impacts been for you and how have you kind of overcome some of the unhelpful um, influence and impacts that porn has had on your life? Um, Long-term impacts for me is um, I, you know, as I said, I felt very much emotionally deficit and uh, I did turn to binge drinking and uh, drugs throughout my later teen years. By the time I was 18, I I had my first nervous breakdown. So um, I had several mental health episodes after that. And I I just continued in a very unhealthy uh, cycle, if you like, of that addiction and diving into the drugs, more sex, more alcohol. It was a very um, turbulent time, particularly up until around the age of 23. And it wasn't until uh, I met my future partner that um, that he said, hmm, either me or the drugs. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> was that an easy choice to make? It, it was really because, uh, you know, I couldn't go any further down. I was um, pretty pretty messed up and I, I didn't quite understand at the time what he saw in me. Um, and, and then Natasha, you asked about, you know, where to from there. It was just very much a, a challenge to, I guess, acknowledge the harms that I had done to myself and internally work through those in a process. And I, and I think when I got to a point where I realised actually I have a message or, or something to give back in this space that I thought, you know, if I can help one person through my journey, then now I'd educate in this space a lot, you know, it's all been worth it. In a moment, we'll ask you, Liz, about the importance of educating uh, kids in terms of minimising the harmful effects of what you're talking about. Uh, it's something experts are calling for, including Michael Flood from the University of New South Wales. Some people look to pornography because they want information about sex, about bodies and so on. We should be explicitly engaging young people in conversations about the sexist and violent supportive messages in pornography so they're less likely to take them on. In effect, we can inoculate people against some of pornography's harmful effects. And this is Susan McLean, who we heard from earlier in the episode as well. No one can wave the magic wand and fix it. It's, it's not as simple as that. We need to be uh, more aware of the reality and then put in place steps in order to be able to empower parents in particular to have rational and relevant conversations with their children about the potential harm so that if they see it, they will come forward and have a conversation with a significant adult in their life who can then help them work through those issues. If you've just joined us, you're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. And we're speaking with Liz Walker, who is the founder of Youth Wellbeing Project, uh, looking at the enormous impact of pornography on kids and young people. Liz, I want to ask you, what does a world in which pornography dominates people's sense of sexuality look like? Look, there's so many outcomes and each individual is going to be impacted by pornography in, in a different way. Not every child who sees pornography like I did would then play out those, um, you know, problem sexualized behaviours. Children will internalise or, or express those um, feelings in, in different ways. I, I really want to get this message across really clearly. Not every child who sees pornography is going to end up with the same sorts of issues that I did. But uh, unfortunately, uh, what we are seeing is an increase in the number of children who are sexually abusing other children. And uh, we're definitely seeing uh, in a cultural sense a disregard for um, empathy and particularly in teenagers really struggling to understand what sexuality is all about, struggling to understand consent and respect and, uh, you know, the derogatory messages that come through pornography are really disempowering to both men and women. So we're seeing a real disconnect. We, we sometimes hear people say that at, at the very least this kind of material creates a very unrealistic expectation for people when they engage in real relationships as opposed to the sorts of things they might see online. Definitely. And you've got all the body image issues that arise. You know, usually porn stars are hired for their, the shape and size of their body parts. And so unfortunately, some of these things that we're seeing in pornography is completely unrealistic and then uh, you know young men expecting young women to perform like that. I actually I heard one expert on cyber safety say that all children who use the internet will see porn. I mean it's hard to get your head around that especially as uh, people who grew up in quite a different world. Um, is it really everywhere? Is that really the case? Absolutely. If parents listening to this you're kidding yourself if you think that your kids won't see porn. I know there's some parents that are really diligent on this and put filters in and do all the right things, but that's no guarantee. You know, all it takes is going to school and, uh, you know, somebody else showing, going over for a sleepover or whatever the case may be. So bubble wrapping our children is not the answer and ignoring and, and hoping that this topic would go away. I'm, I'm sorry, it's just not. So, so what is the answer? What do you tell people? You've got this uh, wellbeing uh, organisation. What do you guys do and what's the sort of educative element to this? I take a very holistic approach to sexuality and in all of our uh, resources, I'm looking at, okay, what's for this particular age group? How do we bring in uh, sexuality? How do we 
talk about, you know, the emotion and the mental impacts. Um, and for some people, that includes the spiritual aspects as well. How can we bring that into the conversation? And also looking at the external influences of, you know, family and uh, social media, uh, peers. Our sexuality is very much formed by uh, those internal and external factors. So when I talk about educating primary school children, I'm not talking about teaching them about sex right from grade one. It's very much about body safety or, or protective behaviours and teaching them what to do if, if somebody touches them inappropriately or recognising those internal warning signs when they might feel unsafe teaching them the correct anatomical terms for their body parts so that if somebody does touch them, then they're like, that's wrong, I need to tell my safe adult. And then also transferring those same set of skills so that they know if they see something online or if they hear something that's really troubling to them that they reach out to their safety people and talk to them. I'm going to take a guess and say that you might get a bit of opposition to what you you suggest there'll be some people who say look pornography you know as long as it's not extreme is you know kind of not too bad it might even uh, help people in their relationship how do you respond when people say things like that look everybody's going to have a view, different view on pornography and at the end of the day adults can make a conscious decision for themselves would I ever recommend pornography to adults? No, I think it actually takes the focus away from the partner and uh, puts it onto something else that's often unreal. So when you've got um, a healthy relationship in that sexual space and, and can look at one another um, with that complete vulnerability, I think it's, it's a powerful experience that can't be replaced by looking at something else. Liz, I'm sure that parents listening to this, like it's quite a terrifying scenario um, and situation to hear about. Um, and I'm sure they're wondering, you know, what is it that we can do? Like, it's really hard to have this conversation mm. with your kids, but it's a really important conversation to have. Um, you've just written a children's book uh, that kind of addresses this gap in, you know, how do we go about doing that? Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, Not For Kids uh, is all about protecting kids online. And uh, Millie teaches children to uh, recognise if there's uh, something unsafe or uncomfortable that they feel. It's beautiful. It's got poetry or it's all written in rhyme and uh, beautiful artwork that kids can really identify with. And so Millie is a young girl who loves pictures and artwork and all things colourful. And one day she's at school and she gets handed this phone and she sees a movie that makes her feel wiggly and icky and um, she knows that it's not for her and she hands back the phone and and through this book Millie teaches children that I, I wasn't in trouble and I wasn't to blame for seeing that but now I know that it's wise to look away quickly or cover my eyes and she reaches out to mum because that's her safe person and so it also teaches children to think about who their safe adult is and who they would talk to. It's really non-confronting. And so there's not big words used that, you know, mean that you have to have a huge conversation about what is pornography or what is sex. It just gives that real sense that, you know, there's some things that adults do that you were never meant to see. And so if that's you, reach out and talk to an adult so that you can feel okay about yourself if that's your experience. And it also gives parents an opportunity to go, okay, I can be brave enough to brace this with my child and prepare them for the inevitable. And finally, Liz, uh, we've talked about this sort of wave of especially internet pornography. It's a bit of a grim picture for those of us who are concerned about it. But what is the future like? Do you think the tide can in any way be turned? And if not, what's the the answer to that? People speaking up. The, The Australian Senate has the inquiry open at the moment till the 10th of March and people can write in either individually or they could contact me through Youth Wellbeing Project and say look I've got this story about my child I'm concerned I want to add my voice to this inquiry. I think it's really time that we stop ignoring this issue and now is the time to speak. If this is something that you go I'm freaked out about this and I don't know what to do this is an action point. Well, yeah, this is an incredibly important um, and difficult topic to talk about. Thank you for telling us your story, Liz, um, and for 
giving us some tips on what we can start to do about this issue. Uh, if you want more information um, or if you want to get hold of Liz's book, Not For Kids, uh, you can find it uh, by going online, going to notforkids.info. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Life and Faith.